Lord, how is it that you will reveal yourself to us and not to the world? And Jesus answered him, Those who love me will keep my word, and my mother will be in them, and I will come and make, and we will come and make our home, our abiding place with them. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words, and the word that you hear is not from me, but is from the mother who sent me. The Gospel of the Lord. May you be seated. One of the earliest dreams I remember having is probably from when I was about three or four years old. I remember quite vividly, actually, I'd spent the night in my parents' bed with them, and I dreamed that I was standing outside of our house, watching my dad drive away in a red convertible. And I ran after him calling because in the dream, I knew that he wasn't just driving away. He was leaving. I don't know why I had this dream. He never would have left us. I never worried that he might. We certainly never owned a red convertible. (laughs) For all I know, it was images playing along to some country song coming through my parents' clock radio that morning while I slept. But what I do know is that the idea of losing him was so terrible, so devastating, that even now, 35 years later, Just remembering that dream, I can still feel the echoes of that desolation in my chest. It's not just an emptiness. It's an emptiness that hungers. It's like a gaping chasm. Hole too great to ever be filled, though the whole world should fall into it. And I can't help but feel that same hungry emptiness in St. John's story. I hear it in the disciples' questions when Thomas wonders, how can we know the way? Or when Philip asks, show us the Father. Or when Judas says, how will you reveal yourself to us? I hear Jesus trying to stave it off as he says again and again and again, I love you. I am with you. Even when I am gone, another will come. I will not leave you orphaned. That word orphaned, I think, is used very intentionally. This is not just the story of a group of friends losing one of their own. This is the story of a community who are afraid of losing their connection to God. St. John says that the religious leaders have lost sight of God to to the degree that when God's own son... The word made flesh stands among them. Their response is fear and hatred and violence. But these people, they have seen God in the Son. And now that Son is being taken away from them. They aren't just losing their friend. They're losing their father, their mother, their parent. And so reading this story today, I wonder if it might be this sense of abandonment, of orphaning, this painful feeling of isolation that is driving us when we are at our worst. I know that in the moments when which I fail to love, I am often feeling the need to defend or protect or grasp at something that I'm afraid is being taken from me, something like control or resources or time or energy. It's the times when I'm feeling overwhelmed by my responsibility of caring for myself or for others or for the world around me and simply don't feel up to the task that I fail to love. As I think about the people we hate and fear most in this world, I wonder if they might be driven by those same things. The need for security, for order, for wealth or power, or even simply respect. I wonder if somewhere inside, they're simply doing what they feel they have to do in order to survive, to secure whatever it is they're afraid of losing. 
On the other hand, I think back to last week's story, to Stephen, who, while having everything taken from him, wished only to give more. Everything that the world spends its time seeking, Stephen seems to have found, and not in the places or the ways in which the world is looking. Stephen has no power, no control, no security, no safety, no justice. And yet it's not the lack that defines his story, but the presence, the abundance, the withness that he experiences. Reading this story and thinking back to Stephen's experience, I get the impression that what Jesus is trying to impart to his disciples is the polar opposite of that hungry emptiness that I experienced in my dreams so long ago. Instead of abandonment and orphaning, Jesus promises his disciples a kind of togetherness that transcends time and space and even death itself. Though he will be leaving, another advocate is coming, and that, and through that advocate, Jesus himself will continue to be with them, with us. Instead of an experience of leaving, Jesus' departure paradoxically endows them with an experience of coming home, of permanent dwelling and enduring presence. An experience of abiding. When Paul walked the streets of Athens, he saw a city filled with idols and temples to different gods. A sight like that would have been proof to any of his fellow Jews of the God-forsakenness of this Gentile capital. But that's not what Paul saw. Paul saw something different. Instead of rampant idolatry, he saw the abiding presence of God, alive and active in a people who didn't even know who this God was. In our searching and groping for God, we erect idols to many different gods, from money to power to race to national identity. We religious folks have our own idols too, idols to tradition or creed or doctrine or practice. But even as we fall short of the God for whom we are searching, the idols themselves are a testament to that which we seek, a sign of what we're searching for to fill that hungry emptiness. As we look around us for external things to fill that void, Paul and Jesus both want to assure us that the abiding presence we seek is closer than we might think. You will know that I am in my mother, and you in me, and I in you, Jesus says. Did you hear that? The God whom we seek abides in us already. We need not fear the hungry emptiness that drives us to defend and protect and acquire and possess because we abide in God and God abides in us. Thomas Merton even observes that one cannot know oneself apart from knowing God and one cannot know God apart from knowing oneself. I'm convinced that's what Jesus means when he says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Our English-speaking ears want to hear that as an imperative. I love Jesus, therefore I must keep his commandments. But that's not what he says. He's stating a simple fact. Those who love him keep his commandments. He might as well be saying, if the sky gets dark, it's going to rain. And in John's gospel, there is only one commandment that Jesus ever gives us to keep. Remember what it is? Love one another another as I have loved you. I wonder if we fail to keep this commandment because we fail to believe in God's love for us. It's so much easier to believe in our own faults and shortcomings than it is to believe in our inherent worth. To believe that what's wrong with us or the wrongs we have committed are the things that define us. 
Could it be that that's what makes us unable to look past the faults and the shortcomings of others? If we can't believe in our own belovedness, how are we ever to believe in the belovedness of another? When we give our sins the power to define us or others, those sins become our idols. They become our higher power, the ones that give us our meaning. And they join the other idols along the streets of Athens. But our, ability, our inability to love one another does not negate the love that God already lavishes upon us. That love alone, the love that creates us and animates us, the love in which we live and move and have our being, that is the only thing that can show us the truth of who we are in God. That God creates us as expressions of God's love. You are the love of God made flesh. Only the infinite love of God, infinitely pouring itself out upon us and for us, can wash away the stain of our own shame and guilt. Even as we erect our pagan temples to gods that we hope will give us satisfaction and fulfillment, even as we worship at the altars that we pray will save us from this hungry emptiness, God abides in, with, and under us. God chooses to make God's home with us. To believe this of ourselves helps us to believe it of others. And to believe it of others helps us to believe it of ourselves. We abide in God and God abides in us when we abide in one another. I think that might be the mystery that Jesus is trying to share with us. I think that might be the mystery that allowed Stephen to respond the way he did in his story. The recognition that God abides in his murderers just as God abides in him helps him to love them. And in that moment, that love reveals Jesus to him. I think it was seeing that truth that showed him the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God and that that revelation moved him to compassion beyond human imagination. As I think about what this story might mean for us, I wonder what might be keeping us from recognizing the infinite love of God being poured out on us. I wonder what keeps us from seeing God abiding in ourselves or in one another. As we consider what it might look like for us to love others who make themselves so hard to love at times, I wonder what we might learn from the stories of Jesus and Stephen or all the other faithful people throughout history who have followed the way. As we continue to search and grope for a God hidden just beyond our sight and sense, I wonder where that God might be revealing God's self to us. In ordinary people, ordinary things, things as simple as water, or wine, or bread. My friends, it is so easy for us to look out at the world and see where God is absent. To see the people, and the places, and the situations that are God forsaken. It takes strength and determination and above all, love to look out at the world and see it saturated in God's abiding presence. We cannot do this thing on our own. It is a feat far beyond us. But thankfully, we have an advocate, a helper, provided to us out of God's own deep love. 
I pray that she may help you to see how much you mean to God. That she may show you that God abides in you and you in God and that in God we abide in each other. For this is what love is.